tragic day in India as rescue operations continue after three trains uh, collided, which led to the deaths of over 300 people. Over 900 are injured and the toll might uh, even rise. India, of course, has a parliamentary standing committee looking specifically at matters to do with the ma massive railway network in the country. Uh, despite all of this, the question to be asked is, why is the safety of India's passenger network still under a question mark? In Singapore, the uh, Shangri-La dialogue is underway. U.S. Secretary of Defense uh, Lloyd Austin has headlined the event as the U.S. and China, as usual, traded blame. But an opportunity was missed for dialogue between the two countries. We ask, uh, given the situation or the sour relationships between the two superpowers, what is the future of security on the Asian continent? And finally, the World Bank has a new chief, Ajay Pal Singh Banga, takes over and has a vision a dream of a world that is free of poverty and a world that is livable. But what are the structural and other challenges that he needs to meet in order for that dream to be translated into a reality? Our first story, uh, as it is of course on most major news networks at this point, is uh, the tragic rail accident that took place in eastern India on Friday. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, over 300 people, at least 300 people have been killed in that tragic incident involving two passenger trains and a freight train. Uh, there are, of course, India has a vast, vast uh, rail network that is extremely important and considered a strategic sort of sector in the country. Uh, but this vast network has not been able to upgrade and modernize uh, in, at pace with the demands that it faces. Uh, we look at some of the structural issues that the railways in India face. Uh, Pragya joins us now in studio for more details on that subject. Pragya, uh, one of the experts we were listening into uh, a little while ago was pointing out that the passenger rail network in India alone uh, on a daily basis carries as many people as uh, the whole country of Australia, for example. Uh, so clearly there's a massive amount of load uh, on this network. What are the kind of structural issues that exist when it comes to securing this vast rail network? Yes, Siddhant, you know, it is said to be the biggest and the fourth biggest uh, railway network in the world, depending on how you're uh, basically measuring. measuring. Mm. But, I mean, the railways has two parts, the, the rolling stock and the traction. And the entire service, there's a separate administrative service in India dedicated to the railways. Mm. For a while, uh, they have not had a separate budget, which they used to have. Uh, this government, when it came to power, decided that they would sort of merge the days on which the budgets are announced and also sort of merge the budgets. So it feels like they're deprioritizing a lot of the expenses which the railways ought to be undertaking while making very grand announcements about the railways. Mm. And I'm sure that as, <clears throat> you know, as the initial shock of this tragedy fades, this kind of spotlight is going to be trained on the government, asking them why their priorities seem skewed. Mm. So, so the problem is that the traction, meaning the, the tracks on which the train run, yeah. needs to be upgraded at a certain pace, around 4,000 kilometers a year. Right. And they've never actually been able to meet that target. Mm. They're also supposed to electrify the tracks, which there has been a lot of success in. Mm. But mm. then you have along with tracks the signaling system. Right. Now, the entire railways is... Uh, it's an engineering-based service. You have mechanical engineering, you have electrical engineering, and there was a, a right to information uh, application filed this year mm. in March, which showed that the vacancies at the top level, the topmost tier of railway administration in India, out of the nine top posts, five are vacant. Wow. Um, it showed that there are more than 300 mechanical engineers not in their posts. So there are these promises of uh, sort of filling up the vacancies, mm -hmm. but no one seems to be paying attention. And overall, like that expert was saying, I later went and checked, there are actually 300,000 total posts vacant. And the railway workers have been complaining that they're working double shifts, mm -hmm. they're sleepy, mm -hmm. they're sleepless. And, and you know, these kind of questions are bound to be asked again the moment the shock of 300 deaths, 900 injuries, many people missing actually mm. fades. There's also a problem in India that the, the traffic on railways, both the passenger traffic and the freight traffic, has actually been increasing by over a thousand percent wow. if you look at the decadal uh, trends. Mm. So, but the track obviously is not keeping track, yeah. uh, keeping pace. track pace with that sort of a growth. Mm. So then the signaling comes under a 
under a lot of pressure. pressure. Mm. Again here, the problem is that the government has, you know, tried to do things like renaming stations. Mm. Now, for them, it's a political, you know, sort of justification which they find for it. But it burdens the railways with renaming in their system. The mm. railways are totally independent system of communication and signaling. And everybody gets confused by these sudden measures which they take. And I'm pretty sure that that's where the finger of blame will be pointed, whether they're updating the rolling stop, which is the wagons, uh, at the pace it should be. Yeah. Now, there are particular kind of trains which, when there is a collision, don't climb over each other, mm, right? Mm, mm. And those are supposed to be replaced. I uh, was looking for the data. I wasn't really able to find it. But it is a recommendation of a government committee mm. to migrate to those tracks. Now, I don't know. There's a stationary train which collides with a moving train, mm. a passenger train, mm. and which shifts to the next track as a result of the collision. Yep. And then another train coming from the opposite direction strikes it. So, I mean, both the trains are higher speed trains. Mm. One is what is known as an express train. Mm. These speed, train speeds in India are not high compared to, you know, what you would, what find, you would in, find in the West. Yeah. In the West or even in many countries in Asia, yeah, you know, sure, but sure. Japan, China. China yeah, yeah. But still, the whole idea of running f faster and faster trains has also been questioned. Mm. One more problem that the railway structurally is facing at the moment is of trying to recover from the COVID pandemic. Right. There was about $9 billion they were given as an interest-free loan, mm. which the railways, because its passenger traffic dropped by almost 90% during mm. the lockdown. Mm. So they had no revenue, right. which means it depend directly on the government, government. to give them uh, basically a special loan. Yeah. And the special loan got entirely used up to pay the pensions of the retirees. So now, what happens is that when such moments arise, the government uses it to justify either cuts or privatization, or privatization, which they don't call privatization because it's a sensitive issue. The railways are the biggest employer in India, yeah. but they call it monetization, mm. meaning that they, <laughs> it's you're playing with words, but at moments like yeah. this, you realize that you're also responsible for lives. Yeah. Accidents can happen. Yeah. But the huge number of fatalities is because of the push for high speed. Is it because of signaling failure? Is it because the people who are supposed to watch the signals uh, mm. are tired and not rested enough? Yeah. All that we we'll, we are still to find out. Probably a multiplicity of, of factors uh, leading up to this. But yeah, given also yeah. how complex the actual accident seems to have been. But uh, you touched on a couple of issues. One is, of course, the manpower, the, the personnel shortage that, that the railways is facing. Uh, this is a government that has both promised uh, to create jobs, to increase employment, and has uh, failed on that count, yeah. uh, of course. Uh, but the railways were once considered by a country like India to be a strategic sort of uh, sector and therefore to be kept uh, under the aegis of the government, uh, come what may, given the, you know, the, the kind of geography and uh, all the jobs that the railways uh, ha right. contributes to. Uh, in that context, uh, and we've seen similar things happening in Europe as well, the Greek train incident uh, right. that happened very recently, also a result of similar sort of neoliberal uh, riders of privatizing, etc. Does that, in your opinion, play a major role in, in how things are proceeding? It does. I mean, at, on the one hand, the government has to do a lot of things at the same time. Mm. Uh, it has to make the, tra uh, make the platforms, the stations better. It has to improve the kind of services they gave on the yeah, railways it yeah. has to also there is a pressure to make higher speed trains uh, more accessible mm. but what you know sometimes you are you know sometimes the government is rightly criticized for trying to push what can only be called a vanity project so this becomes a reality check the problem is that the reality check is coming at the cost of many hundreds of lives right. yeah. and other kinds of losses as well now you know maybe the government will try to think about making capital expenditure its priority, capital mm. expenditure on safety. Mm. You know, one thing that the Indian media is really talking about is this thing called the shield, the kavach, mm. uh, which is supposed to be a indigenously developed system to, you know, a warning system to prevent accidents from happening. Mm. All that is fine, but it's only being tested on 1,200 kilometers of track right. right now in one segment of the railways. The Indian Railways has 100,000 kilometers of track. So again, you're tom-toming something, but you don't really have much to show for it on the ground. It has been repeatedly criticized for underplaying the, uh, the, the 
personal aspect of mm. railways. The mm. railways is not a place where people are, you know, as is often said by the government that people are needlessly employed. They're not. They're all technically trained staff yeah. who have particular responsibilities. Specific roles, yeah. Yes. So those specific roles, if someone is not there, the job is not going to happen and mm. someone will pay the price for it. We also have certain tracks which still have the old signaling system where every kilometer there will be a warning light which the train driver has to see, the pilot has to actually track, watch for it. Mm. So all these things we still have to see, but these are the, some fundamental issues with the railways has been facing and which invariably is responsible for any accident that occurs. Thanks very much, Pragya, for uh, giving us some insight into how this uh, complex system works. And of course, uh, also a small update on uh, the possible questions that the government will need to answer right. after this uh, tragedy. Our next story is also from the Asian continent. We're talking about a major security conference that is underway in Singapore known as the Shangri-La Dialogue. Unfortunately, since a major factor in the Asian security environment these days is the relationship between the United States and China, the dialogue is actually not much of one. Uh, another opportunity has been missed for formal organized conversations between the military establishments of the United States and China even though the Defense Minister of China as well as the Defense Secretary of the United States are both present at the event. Prabhu Prakayasta, NewsClick's Editor-in-Chief, is with us. He's following developments at the conference and looking at whether any substantial conversations are actually taking place. Uh, Praveen, given uh, the sort of uh, times we're in, uh, any conversation or broad conversation around uh, security in Asia is of course directly linked to the relationship between the United States and China. Uh, and it seems like it, this is uh, this Shangri-La dialogue, as it's known, is another missed opportunity for actual communication between uh, these two departments of their uh, respective governments. How do you see it? Well, I think there are two aspects to the Shangri-La dialogues. Of course, it is much more Western-oriented in the sense that Singapore is not a neutral player. It is mm -hmm. a essentially a part of the larger U.S. scheme of things. And it's one of the few countries in Southeast Asia which has actually sanctioned uh, Russia. So it's very much a part of the U.S. camp and seen to be such. And therefore, Shangri-La dialogues, uh, it's nothing to do with Shangri-La of uh, the, what is it, Hilton, Hilton, who wrote that book, Shangri-La, placing it in somewhere in Tibet. So yeah. it's nothing to do with that. It's yeah. really to more to do with the current political alignments in the world. And in that, it's really firmly towards, oriented towards the United States. So the three major players which are on that side, who are presented over here, you're right, they, there isn't much of a dialogue that's going on because it is the United States, it's uh, the European Union, partners in the NATO, and there is, of course, Japan and Australia of the AUKUS Treaty. Mm. All four of these are very much there. Even India has a very weak presence in the Shangri-La Dialogue. The Chinese defense minister is there. But again, uh, Lloyd Austin and he has no, are not meeting. The mm. United States proposed that they meet. But, you know, the issue that has always been irksome for anybody on this count is that he's under sanctions. So he's not allowed to travel to the United States. They want a meeting with him and they say, oh, what's the problem? You know, you can meet any other place. Uh, sanctions shouldn't be any particular problem. But it is demeaning for a defense minister to be under sanctions of another country, yet having a dialogue with him. Yeah. So I think the U.S. has to really get its, uh, you know, priorities clear. What does it want to do? And before I get into the substantive part of the question you are asking, mm. I'm really looking at the larger uh, optics of this issue. Is earlier, the U.S. has cancelled the visit to uh, China because of this balloon incident, if you yeah. remember. Yeah, Antony was, Blinken was scheduled to visit. Yeah, he cancelled his visit. And later on, Biden, when he's talking about, you know, we should really expect a thaw in U.S.-Chinese relationship, he talked about the same balloon incident, by calling it a silly balloon incident. So who was silly, of course, is not clear. They have already proposed a meeting, which again, China turned down exactly for this, saying we cannot have a defense meeting if the defense minister of China is under your sanctions. 
Mm. So that issue, once it has been raised, then you cannot say, well, in Shangri-La, can we meet on the sidelines? Because the issue remains the same. So I think they don't want to change that framing of it. So what's the point of this discussion? Mm. Now, Defense Minister has met, of China has met with Borel, he's met with other people. But again, there doesn't seem to be anything coming out if Ukraine or Taiwan is the issue. There doesn't seem to be any substantive discussion taking place on either front. Fair enough, Prabir. Uh, we, we leave it there, I think, for today. Uh, thanks again for joining us on Daily Debrief. And of course, uh, this uh, larger trend of uh, conversations, particularly given the variety of potential flashpoints we have uh, from the Pacific to South Asia, of course, and then there's, of course, West Asia, uh, will continue on the show. And finally, the World Bank has a new chief, Ajay Pal Singh Banga, a banker and the first person of colour to hold the position, has taken office for a five-year term. Uh, Banga has told his employees in an effort to rally the troops that development will be a key focus and of course that he has a dream uh, that the world will become a place free of poverty and will be livable, which essentially means that he will have to deal or the World Bank in its uh, structures and its lending and investments will have to look at aspects of climate change, uh, public health and other such uh, scenarios. In that context, we have with us uh, Jyotsna Singh to talk specifically about public health from a global perspective and looking at how World Bank lending actually plays a major role uh, in the system and the kind of challenges that Banga will have to deal with in a structured manner in order to actually achieve some of the dreams in his vision. Josan, good to have you with us in the Daily Debrief studio. Uh, you're just back from the World Health Assembly, so a lot of these discussions probably fresh in your mind. Uh, the World Bank is a major player in, of course, public health uh, uh, globally. Uh, and if we look at public health from the perspective of being the end result of all sort of social, economic, political determinants, right? How healthy the world is. Uh, just from that perspective, what are the sort of strategic uh, or structural objectives that, or, that Banga has uh, in front of him as leader of the World Bank now uh, in order to promote this vision that he has talked about of a livable planet, of a planet free of poverty? Uh, so I think the first thing is that a lot of things that World Bank has been pushing for, including maybe some of the principles based on which World Bank was founded, yeah. have to undergo major changes. Mm. Uh, so if we talk a couple of specific things, so for example, uh, the uh, World Bank's uh, uh, entire structural adjustment policies, mm. uh, which have led uh, developing countries not just into major debt crisis across the world, but yeah. also also, uh, uh, ensuring that there is less expenditure on health, on education, on so social sectors like this, mm. uh, that has to change. Mm. And this entire push for privatization and commercialization, uh, which World Bank policies again uh, make countries go for, yeah. that also needs to to change uh, completely. There mm. is uh, definitely more of a say of uh, the uh, 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 transnational corporations mm. and the rich countries mm. in a uh, uh, World Bank than the Global South. Um, so all of those things, the, the entire direction in which the World Bank really pushes mm. uh, the countries, that has to undergo change. It's important because of course, while while Banga is being hailed as the first person of color to be in, in this position, we also have to remember that he is in a point that has been suggested by the US president uh, and, and so so in that sense uh, how, how do you see things playing out uh, you might talk of sort of development uh, driven changes but is that really possible or even within the ambit of what the World Bank wants to do so firstly I think uh, the, uh, having a person of color should not be a tokenism mm. but really maybe someone who is uh, comes because of uh, a history of maybe helping the developing countries or so. Mm. I mean, we saw during the pandemic, uh, the WTO Director General, yeah. uh, Okonja Iviala, was from Nigeria, mm. is, is from, from Nigeria. Nigeria. Mm. And, uh, but uh, nobody could do anything about the TRIPS waiver, something that could have brought some equality mm. uh, in delivery of vaccines and medicines across the world. Yeah. Uh, it, it was uh, not, it could not go through. Mm. So, so it is not about tokenism. Mm. Uh, when we talk, it has to be true representation, which we still do not see in these bodies because mm. even if the head comes from and it, 
even if we talk about WHO, yeah. uh, Dr. Tedros comes from Africa, from mm. Ethiopia. Mm. Uh, but if you look at the entire staff is very mm. wide. The policies mm. are very wide uh, driven. Yeah. So so it, it's it's just nothing more than tokenism, really. Mm. Uh, so so that is where so the problem would lie. So the expectations also need to be tempered on, on the, uh, that basis, I guess. Uh, you were yeah. talking uh, before we started uh, about, uh, you know, some of the more specific aspects of uh, the project-based approach also and how that's been detrimental to actually countries, uh, especially low and middle income countries, I guess, uh, building long-term public health systems that are robust and able to deal with the challenges. True. So two examples. One, WHO is increasingly talking about performance-based financing, mm. uh, which uh, means that uh, you prepare a project, a short-term project, mm. a few years, two to three years, not even a decade long. Mm. Okay. And uh, you start to measure how much money have you been able to save of a government of or the world by investing in some health uh, outcome yeah. or a parameter. Mm. Now, this is a very, very narrow focus uh, when we talk about health really. I mean, uh, things like quality of life or health or uh, education for that matter, mm. cannot. their value is not only in terms of money, saving mm. money or not. It is about general well-being of the population. So, so that idea is missing. And what happens with this is, and as I said, with privatization or public-private partnerships, which yeah. uh, World Bank pushes for, the whole, uh, it's, it is narrowing down the... Uh, 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 value of life mm. um, so and therefore it is more on project basis and in a similar fashion if we see uh, then uh, uh, world bank is discussing the pandemic uh, fund that is a few countries have uh, 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 is in are investing and there is this fund which is not only for the future pandemic when mm. it happens but also for prevention but the entire focus is on uh, is not on lives of people but on what we call as health security right. that is you only monitor and do surveillance to uh, to see where there is a possibility of uh, a, a pandemic arising out. Right. You get information of the pathogen, the virus or the mm. bacteria, which can lead to it. Uh, and, uh, and that is where it stops. So most of the money is spent on that, not on response that if the pandemic comes, then how do we ensure that there is equal distribution of vaccines and medicines and other products? Mm. Um, so so the, all of this is very narrowly focused and everything feeds into what the Western countries want. want. And, when you, and when you couple uh, with what you were mentioning earlier about the debt situation, it kind of also restricts government's ability to spend themselves as well. Precisely. World Bank is again saying that, you know, more and more the countries should depend on domestic fund and uh, it should be spending on health and education. But the international financing mechanism mm. is actually taking away, sucking the money out from the developing countries mm. by giving loans mm. and uh, not letting them invest on uh, uh, things which can uh, uh, give more resources to the developing countries yeah. uh, and then again giving the loans to so this loan cycle and the debt cycle that the global south is in it's where is the money for them yeah. to actually invest on health and education mm. so uh, you put some policies in place yeah. which don't let people have money yeah. countries have money and then you say spend on spend health on uh, this is as ironical and as dirty game yeah. as possible that All right. it, uh, finally very quickly if we can just touch on uh, because multilateralism or engaging with multilateral organizations is something that uh, has been touched on by Banga. Uh, how do you see the relationship between the World Bank and the WHO? Well, right now it's not a very healthy one. I mean, uh, uh, world. In fact, WHO is now discussing certain policies uh, which World Bank has been pushing for, and we as activists have been fighting against that. We need uh, more humane policies coming from WHO, not the way World Bank works. Mm. Uh, so uh, it should be the way where WHO's voice can be heard, mm. but more on the basis of rights mm. of the people mm. and of the poorer nations. And it should not come where the World Bank it starts to influence WHO more. And uh, I mean, that is one space which is left where we can at least raise our voices. That should not go away. All right. Hopefully. Thanks. Thanks very much, Josna. We'll leave it there for today. Uh, and I think okay. also with that, we'll bring to a close this episode of the Daily Debrief from Josna, myself and the entire team here at People's Dispatch. Uh, thank you for watching this week's coverage of the news and, and the stories behind the news. Uh, on the Daily Debrief. As always, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org. And of course, don't forget to give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice. We'll be back next week with more uh, conversations uh, of, on what's happening around the world. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye.